So, warmly welcome to today's webinar of the Stockholm Center of Eastern European Studies uh, on protracted conflicts. Uh, I, who uh, host and moderate this webinar today, uh, I am Fredrik Lötqvist and I'm director of the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies, which is a recently established uh, 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 center for for, yes, Eastern European Studies, uh, financed by the Swedish government, but it's uh, independent and it's organizationally based at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs. Uh, we are very happy to uh, have one of our flagship products this year is the report series on human rights and security in Eastern Europe, which is basically about the protracted conflicts and various aspects of, of these uh, protracted conflicts. Uh, this is a report series that all in all will have um, uh, nine reports. And we have the two reports that we will discuss today are reports number five and six in that series. And we will have three more reports coming up in the coming weeks. Uh, and there is, uh, of course, also a connection to the OSCE uh, because uh, the OSCE is one way or another are all involved in uh, uh, these uh, protracted conflicts. This uh, report series is uh, uh, initiated and edited by Dr. Martin Krag and Dr. Andreas Umland at the center. This year, we, uh, 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 it's 30 years after the breakup of the Soviet Union, 31 years after the signing of the Paris Charter and also the vision of a Europe whole, free and at peace, a vision, vision that is still to be realized. We still have open wounds in Europe in the form of protracted conflicts, a threat to the European security and the European security order uh, based on, on international law and the OSCE principles and commitments. And the protracted conflicts uh, 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 entail violations of exactly the international law and the fundamental principles of Helsinki Charter, uh, 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 of, the, of the Helsinki Final Act and the Paris Charter. Pr important principles such as territorial integrity, sovereignty, the, the right of each country to, make, to choose its own security arrangements, and protracted conflicts, in short, uh, implies uh, making permanent uh, uh, violations of, of, of these uh, norms and rules. It also involves the question of military violence and other antagonistic means, hybrid threats, uh, that are used to impose political will on other uh, uh, countries. And this has implications far beyond the countries themselves and the region. Uh, 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 and it also is an issue, uh, a systemic crisis for, for European security. When dealing with these conflicts, um, I think one uh, uh, has to address two uh, political imperatives, or there are two political imperatives in dealing, managing with these conflicts. The first one is uh, the need to restore uh, respect for international law and the OSCE principles and commitments. The other one is a political and diplomatic imperative to make sure that the military violence ends, to start a diplomatic process and a negotiating process and so forth. Sometimes, not always, but often, these two principles or two imperatives uh, uh, come in conflict with each other because one, one has to make trade-offs and, and, and compromises uh, uh, in, 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 in dealing with these conflicts. How to understand these conflicts and what tools do we have to manage them? And, and maybe even solve them, is the topic of today's discussion. And with us, uh, uh, we have uh, 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 the authors of the two reports uh, that is the basis of today's discussion. Uh, and the first report is the Conflict-Solving Mechanisms and Negotiation Formats for Post-Soviet Protracted Conflicts, a comparative uh, perspective by Stefan Wolf, professor at Birmingham University and one of the leading international experts on, on, on conflict, protracted conflicts in Europe. And the other report is Russia's instrumentalization of conflict in Eastern Europe, the anatomy of the protracted conflicts in Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, written by John Sachow, who is currently an um, analyst at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies, but has a background as a Swedish diplomat and has served in, in, in Moscow and also served with the EUMM in Georgia and also had a posting in Berlin also reporting on these issues from there. And um, Veronica Bard. Uh, but then we have uh, two uh, commentators, 
prominent uh, um, experts uh, in the field who will will uh, come are discussants and commentators um, uh, to the introductory remarks of, of, of Professor Wolf and, and, and Jan Sachau. And this is Vladimir Sokol, I think a very well-known analyst and a senior fellow of the Jamestown Foundation, and probably one of the experts that have written and analyzed this most closely and, and most regularly uh, for a wide audience. And Ambassador Veronica Bard, who has served as Swedish ambassador to the OEC, 2007 to 12, then as ambassador, Swedish ambassador to Moscow, and then uh, uh, last posting as Swedish ambassador to UN in Geneva. Uh, we, uh, the uh, outline of today's discussions will be that we will then have introductory remarks by, by Professor Wolf and, 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 and Jan Stachau. Uh, uh, to sort of distill sort of some of the main conclusions and main uh, uh, reflections from the reports. And then uh, 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 um, uh, Vladimir and Veronica will, will then, uh, based on their experience and their knowledge, uh, uh, provide some reflections and comments on this. And then after that, we will have a sort of moderated discussions among uh, uh, the authors and, and the discussants, which I will moderate. Uh, to pick up some of the issues and questions that uh, uh, arise in, in the presentations. And then we will open up the floor for questions and comments uh, from the uh, audience. Um, and uh, this is uh, the audience. You are either participating in this because you have registered through Zoom, uh, which means that you will be able to ask your questions uh, through and, and your comments through the Q&A function which is sort of in the middle, in the lower bar of your uh, uh, window, computer screen. Or if you, this is also live streamed on Facebook. Uh, and if you are on Facebook and want to ask questions, please use the comment field uh, and the comments will then, uh, your, your questions will be forwarded to me. You who, uh, those of you who wish to ask questions and make comments, please uh, uh, state your, your uh, full name and possible also affiliation, uh, because we want to avoid sort of uh, anonymous uh, 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 participants uh, today. This, uh, today's webinar is recorded and it will be also uh, 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 be, be able to be view and listen to this later on through uh, the, the UI homepage. Uh, and uh, 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 and we will try to keep strictly to the 90 minutes uh, time limit for today's discussions. So with these introductory remarks, I'm happy then to hand over the word to Professor Wolf, please. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick, uh, both for your very kind introduction, uh, but also for um, involving me in this um, very exciting uh, project in the in the first place. Uh, I don't want to take up uh, too much time with my introductory remarks and just focus on a few key points. Uh, the first one, uh, which is very trivial and very obvious, uh, is that none of the existing multilateral uh, negotiation formats for the protracted conflicts in the OSCE region to date have settled um, any uh, of these uh, conflicts. Um, in my view, one of the reasons uh, for this, and I want to emphasize here, it's just one uh, of the reasons, is the fact that they involve multiple stakeholders with diverse and uh, often incompatible agendas, not just the immediate conflict parties. Um, in my view, this adds a further layer of complexity to the conflicts and the conflict settlement mechanisms that has not been sufficiently addressed and probably cannot be addressed within or by the existing dialogue formats. Um, most prominent uh, among these problems, in my view, are the role of Russia as a mediator and often simultaneously as a conflict party, um, and then closely related to that, the deepening divide between Russia and the West on a whole range of issues, which in turn then is mirrored by the divide on the ground between the de facto authorities in the breakaway regions and the governments of their metropolitan states. In my view, Russian obstruction, therefore, is clearly one factor um, that accounts for the lack of uh, settlements. But I also want to emphasize that it is not the only one. Um, from my perspective, um, even if Moscow were to drop its resistance to a settlement, it's far from certain 
that the immediate conflict parties would uh, be able uh, to settle uh, on a just and fair new arrangement uh, regarding their relationships in line with the OSCE norms and uh, principles and to do so quickly. That said, um, the existing dialogue formats have, um, in particular through a relentless pursuit of conflict and security building measures, contribute to some stabilizations in most of the protracted conflicts. In doing so, however, they have also decreased the sense of urgency to settle the conflicts that they are meant to address. In this light, the way forward from my perspective is not to give up on the existing formats, but to change how the, how the OSCE engages with them and how the OSCE uses them. And the key here would be to develop new and comprehensive strategies for confidence building that are characterized by mutuality, reciprocity, expandability, and retractability. And these strategies then also need to be based on multi-year strategic, financial, and personnel frameworks. Obviously, this is a significant task uh, ahead of an organization that is deeply challenged by a wide range of problems within and beyond the organization. But it is a challenge that the OSCE has the tools to address. And I think ahead of its 50th anniversary in 2025, it is also a challenge that it must rise to in order to retain its relevance as the world's largest comprehensive regional and security organization. So from that perspective, um, I hand over back to you, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, thank you, uh, Stefan, for these very uh, concise and, and, and poignant uh, uh, remarks. Jon, please, over to you. Many thanks. Um, I've tried uh, to take a step back um, and think about what these protracted conflicts have in common uh, with a focus on Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. Um, and I've particularly tried to consider normative aspects, um, and I'll make three initial points about this. The first one is about Russia's involvement. Um, the conflicts played out in Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, they differ in many ways, but what they have in common is antagonistic behavior from Russia's side. And this is not to say that domestic local factors within these countries do not exist, or that they do not matter, or that they do not need to be dealt with. The point is that the conflicts have been and are deliberately instrumentalized by Russia. In the case of Ukraine, also initiated by Russia. And the report that I've written tries to show how Russia undermines the three states' sovereignty and territorial integrity, how Russia has acted and still acts in bad faith, if not in direct violation of international law and other agreed principles and commitments, such as those of the OCE. One can see that some Russian tools have been used repeatedly in all three countries, even if they have been used in different ways with different sequencing and so on. A key tool, for example, has been Russian military forces, which in different capacities over time have been involved in hostilities against legitimate state forces in all three countries. They're also deployed in these countries without host nation consent. That is in clear violation of these states' territorial integrity. And despite this, as Professor Wolf uh, mentioned, Russia denies that it's a party to any of the conflicts um, and instead points towards different illegal structures and groupings in the three countries uh, that in different ways oppose and challenge the legitimate authorities. And these alternative structures, so to say, they be, may be more authentic separatists, like in Georgia, but uh, then one must remember uh, that they are also heavily dependent on support from Russia. Um, and they do not necessarily represent the local population, uh, since large parts of this um, have been displaced. They um, may also partly or completely be made up structures, like the little green men that showed up in Crimea in February 2014, before Russia's illegal annexation. In 
both Georgia and Ukraine, Moscow's policy in this regard has reached the level of Russian recognition of non-government controlled areas as independent states. Abkhazia, what is called South Ossetia, and for a few days also Crimea. Recognition can thus be said to be another tool that undermines the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states like Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. But there are also other reoccurring tools, such as the mass distribution of Russian citizenship, dis disinformation and propaganda, various economic measures, and so on. A second point is that to understand this behavior, you need to understand Russia's policy priorities, both external ones and internal ones. And let's start with the, inter uh, with the external ones. Judging from Moscow's rhetoric and actions, the Russian leadership wants to establish a sphere of influence in what it sees as its neighborhood with not fully sovereign buffer states that should not be allowed to join NATO or the EU and ideally allow for forward deployed Russian military assets. In this context, one may, for example, note that the Kremlin recently pointed out that NATO military infrastructure in Ukraine was a red line for Russia. And an unspecified threat like this illustrates that Ukraine, according to Russia, should not have the right to choose its security arrangements, including treaties of alliance, although this is a fundamental OCE principle. What is sometimes less discussed is that Moscow's goal to establish a sphere of influence also has to do with Russian domestic politics. And I mean this in the sense that the Kremlin wishes to prevent the spread of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. These things are seen as existential threats to the Russian uh, leadership, which fears demand at home for such things. And this also includes things like media freedom, free and fair elections, and so on. And combined, these two goal goals amount to a desire to rene renegotiate the rule book, um, the commonly agreed European security order that also Russia has agreed to, as defined in international law, OSCE principles and commitments, Council of Europe obligations, and so on. And then my last uh, uh, point here, uh, a third point, and that is that not only what happens on the ground matters. Russia instrumentalizes not only conflict, but also conflict resolution formats and processes. In fact, in fact these constitute battlegrounds in themselves uh, for Russia to try to reach its goals, which one must assume assume uh, Moscow does not yet consider achieved. This begins with how the formats are established, how the conflicts and conflict parties are defined, but it also has to do with how, for example, ceasefire arrangement, uh, agreements are formulated and how um, the international field presence should look if such a, is allowed at all. And here one must say that Russia has been rather successful. By using its military force and its veto power in the UN, and in the OCE, Russia has managed to bend these formats and processes to its advantage. More than once, Russia has been allowed to act as a mediator and provider of so-called peacekeeping forces. And meanwhile, other genuinely international presence has been restricted to limited monitoring tasks or local confidence building tasks within the countries um, affected. And as a result, the impression is that some of these conflict resolution processes, they tend to focus on Moscow dictated concessions from the victim states, so to speak, rather than on, on, the, on the Russian violations uh, of international law that uh, perpetuate this, these conflicts. Um, and in the case of Ukraine also initiated uh, the conflict. And certain things like Crimea or the return of internally displaced persons in Georgia um, are not discussed at all. And for various reasons, the democratic international community has more or less played along with this. Um, but I believe that this is something that needs to be reconsidered um, for the sake of the affected states, but also for the international community uh, itself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for your three uh, also concise and clear points.
Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Stefan and John, for, for your introductions. And I really recommend everyone who hasn't read the reports to really uh, read them. They are very substantial. And I would say, uh, 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 without bragging about uh, Stockholm Center of Eastern European Studies, but they are sort of state-of-the-art reports uh, uh, in, of, of its kind uh, uh, in a sort of more policy analytical uh, uh, way. Uh, after these introductions now, I'm very happy to hand over to you, Vladimir, uh, which you have a very uh, a long and deep experience and with your comments and reflections on these reports and these presentations and the situation we are in. Microphone, unmute. Right. Um, as a discussant, I'd like to say that I agree with everything that John Tsarko just said. And moreover, I find it very refreshing in light of the state of the discussion up to this stage. Um, we are in the presence of four interstate conflicts, Russia versus Ukraine, Russia versus Georgia, Russia versus Moldova, Armenia versus Azerbaijan, playing out in six theaters. We all know which the six theaters are. Uh, earlier attempts to portray the conflicts in Georgia and Moldova and even in Ukraine as local intercommunal conflicts never had any credibility. They were meant to absolve Russia for its responsibility as conflict initiator and conflict belligerent. Even in Georgia and Moldova, it's the latest by 1992 the conflicts had evolved into interstate Russia, Moldova, Russia, Georgia conflicts and remain so to the present day. Russia is the main actor in these conflicts, both as an international actor and as a local actor. Its goal is to use the conflicts and the conflict settlements in order to achieve predominant influence over the targeted countries. The, uh, Topical at the present time is the Russian concept of special status for Donbass in Ukraine and for Transnistria in Moldova, which Russia pursues in both these processes. Special status would disorganize, special status for Donbass or for, Ukraine, for Transnistria in Moldova would simply disorganize those two states and that allow Russia to achieve predominant influence in the internal decision-making processes. Russia officially withdrew its former recognition of the territorial integrity of the victim countries in the cases of Georgia, Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Ukraine, Crimea. Russia continues on paper to recognize the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and Moldova in the contested territories, but in practice, Russia prevents Ukraine and Moldova from exercising the territorial integrity and sovereignty that Russia says that it uh, recognizes on paper. Western uh, pronouncements to the effect that we recognize Russia's, uh, Ukraine's and Moldova's territorial integrity within the international recognized borders overlooks the conditional character of this recognition. In Russia's view, the recognition is conditional on Ukraine and Moldova adopting internal constitutional settlements imposed by Russia. So that recognition is conditional. Russia makes uh, that conditionality to override international law. Western diplomacy should recognize this incompatibility. The existing negotiating formats are thoroughly discredited and by now exhausted. The Normandy format is clearly exhausted. It not only achieved nothing, but it cannot even convene anymore because of Russian imposed conditions. Ukrainian insistence that the United States should join the Normandy uh, process in order to give it more balance are naive because they don't recognize the fact that should the United States join the Normandy process, it would have to adopt its acquis, the acquis of the Normandy process with special status for Donbass and co-equal negotiations between Kiev and Donetsk-Luhansk. This is the acquis of the Normandy process. 
and the United States should not join it because it, if, if, if so, it would adopt that Aki. In the case of the means triple means process triple co chairmanship on uh, on uh, the conflict in Karabakh. It has been exhausted simply because Russia has bypassed that process, dealing directly with, Yer with Baku and Yerevan. This has happened for years, long before the outbreak of hostilities in 2020, but it has gone unrecognized. To conclude, recommendations. First, exclude the concept of special status from the negotiations regarding Donbass and Transnistria. This is a Russian imposed uh, concept. It is alien to the European political and legal tradition. Russia pursues these two special status uh, designs in Ukraine and in Moldova, for, formerly in Georgia, before Russia had withdrawn the uh, recognition of Georgia's territorial integrity. So these are Russian injected concepts into ostensibly international negotiations. Western diplomacy should not endorse them. They should be a second, second uh, recommendation. Ukraine and Moldova should not pursue the ambition of resolving these conflicts anytime soon. Ukraine and Moldova are unprepared for a resolution because they do not yet have a rule of law at home. As long as there is no rule of, of law and no constitutionality, really, in Moldova and in Ukraine, any settlement with, uh, with uh, Russia over Transnistria or Donbass would not look, would not operate as it would look on paper. On paper, it may look good. In practice, it would still operate by informal arrangements between Kiev, Donetsk, Luhansk, and Moscow, Kishino, Tiraspol, and Moscow bypassing formal constitutional processes. And moreover, the reinsertion of the voters from Donbass and from Transnistria into Moldovan and Ukrainian elections would change the domestic balance of forces in favor of pro-Russian forces. Ukraine and Moldova should first build rule of law at home and only then engage in settlements. And finally, a recommendation for the OSCE uh, for the OSCE's uh, Swedish chairmanship. It should not seek at this year-end meeting a piece of paper regarding Transnistria for the sake of having a piece of paper at the year-end conference. Previous, uh, year, every, every year-end conference of the OSCE agrees on the lowest common denominator between Russia and the West or a piece of paper about Transnistria that it should be re reintegrated in Moldova with a special status. This is wrong and it should be ditched. And the uh, existing uh, negotiating formats, Normandy, uh, Minsk co chairmanship, uh, 5 plus 2 in Moldova, are illegitimate, are deadlocked, are exhausted, but they should not be officially killed. They cannot be officially killed. No international format uh, really ever dies. They should simply be allowed to weather on the vein, to vegetate and to go into deep hibernation. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir, and also very concise and three clear points and recommendations. Uh, and uh, last but absolutely not least, uh, uh, Ambassador Bard, Veronica, uh, you have been a diplomat and a practitioner and have seen this process very much from the inside and have very practical experience. So very keen to hear your reflections and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. And it is from that angle of a practitioner, I will um, um, offer some general observations. And I may uh, keep the details for the discussion later. I'm, uh, I must say I'm very um, happy, it's maybe not the right word, but it's, it's good to revisit the battlefield. And I'm not thinking of the protracted conflicts as such, but the OSCE, uh, organization and mechan mechanisms, because as we have seen in these two papers, they are still very relevant, though they may need some, some overview. Um, my first general observation is, um, and both um, authors of the papers address this, is the lopsided situation when it comes to knowledge, continuity, capability, and institutional memory. 
um, and I'm thinking of uh, the party which encompasses the, the EU, uh, the, the West, um, uh, the, uh, that needs to update uh, all these areas when it comes to Russia, the Caucasus and Central Asia, and of course the protracted conflicts. And the OSCE as an organization, very often focus only um, um, comes when uh, conflicts erupts or when a uh, member state is about to assume the chairman in office ship, chairman in person ship. And that's obviously too late. Uh, there are exceptions, of course. I, I, um, both authors have mentioned Germany, um, Meseberg, the Meseberg, um Initiative, the Baltic states, Poland, and of course, member states that make use of the OEC as an arena for foreign and security policy agendas are seem to be up to date with uh, these mechanisms. Um, and as Professor Wolf pointed out, this is really high time if uh, member states would like to use the 2025 celebrations of the uh, organizations. Some of us went through a similar process in the run up to the Astana summit, but that process, which was uh, very um, uh, thorough, uh, lacked the political engagement in the end. This was a product of, of very eager and devoted uh, civil servants, but, but these overviews and run-throughs have been done before. So both these papers are really very useful gap fillers to increase knowledge and awareness and to come with uh, recommendations how to improve um, the mechanisms and the processes. Uh, and why is it so important to uh, keep this awareness and, and deepen the knowledge? It's because the risk, without this knowledge, we risk to have no policy at all. And I'm talking about the EU and, and the West, or only have an ad hoc policy, which we have seen could be very dangerous. I would like to point at the uh, French actions um, in 2008. The French uh, EU uh, chairmanship was not prepared to deal with Russia on, uh, on the Georgia war. The chairmanship in office, Finland, was much more uh, prepared, but was not allowed to carry out the negotiations, just as an example. Um, yeah, and there is a risk also to be uh, in, to, that these conflicts are instrumentalized, as has been shown by uh, both authors, or that member states uh, uh, instrumentalize themselves. Also, the lack of overview is dangerous because the OSCE commitments and principles are tightly linked up or should be with uh, e, uh, the UN, international uh, agreements uh, within the UN realm. Uh, and I would like to mention the WTO, WHO and UNHCR, uh, uh, which are arenas where also these um, 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 yeah, the, the, the lack of commitment is being played out. Um, and this is, of course, obstacles. To, will, will they already pose an obstacle to safeguard um, international law, human rights, rule of law uh, standards? Um, to come back to what both authors are suggesting in evaluation of conflict resolution mechanisms and processes, this is very much... Uh, 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 an issue of the international um, um, organizations. You, you, I think we should remind ourselves that the UN Secretary General uh, has a, uh, an agenda, a program to, uh, to brush up and reform uh, the UN, and, and especially when it comes to conflict resolution, because the UN system as such is, is even more than the OECD lacking um, uh, uh, a system for a uh, systematic evaluation and, and to retrieve lessons learned. And right now, uh, buzzwords like resilience in conflict resolution and peace settlement exit strategies are very important because we have seen the setbacks too often. And there, the connection is being made, and that suits the OC very well with, uh, with the three baskets between uh, human rights. Uh, uh, rule of law, state building, that, that are all seen increasingly as important, uh, or, or, or actually the, 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 the issues that, that has to be part of any conflict uh, resolution or, or settlement. 
uh, if we won't uh, see uh, conflict reoccur and relapse. And unfortunately, as we know, uh, too many conflicts um, are, uh, are allowed to relapse. Um, there is one issue that when in the paper um, that uh, Jan Sarko has written, uh, when he, where he explains the NATO-EU behavior, uh, one point that I think is missing, and that is the economic interests of member states and EU states vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia, which is something we one should address as well in order to forge EU unity. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm, I've already surpassed uh, my time or whether I should go into uh, some more detailed um, observations. Um, maybe, maybe, Veronica, I think we can come back to that in, in, in the discussions, panel discussion that we will, we, we will have right now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for this very val valuable and, and also concise and, and, and operational uh, uh, comments and reflections. Uh, and just... Um, on, on uh, also based on my own experience, and uh, I should also declare that I uh, myself uh, 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 served as uh, ambassador of Sweden to the OEC 2012-17, replacing Veronica, uh, and was also there uh, um, uh, 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 at the uh, start of the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine then in 2014. Um, and I can uh, agree, picking up what, what Veronica spoke about this, uh, actually, when you're inside in, in a sort of political and diplomatic uh, negotiation machinery uh, and, and the urgency, uh, I was also there, for instance, when the mandate for the special monitoring mission in, in, in Ukraine uh, was negotiated. Uh, and what struck me in the discussion is that sometimes the, there is this lack of... of uh, 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 continuous sort of knowledge or historical knowledge and also um, there is a view uh, uh, that there is a danger sometimes in politics and diplomacy that you deal you deal with one crisis at a time it's one damn thing after another um, and you don't have this uh, more um, structural uh, uh, view you tend to to view each crisis as an uh, isolated phenomenon uh, and um, uh, you don't uh, uh, take this more structured uh, anal analytical view, which the two authors of these two reports have done, uh, to see also the structural similarities in both how the conflicts are played out, but also in the conflict uh, 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 mechanisms solving or um, uh, managing mechanisms and formats. Um, and, there, um, and you could say that... Uh, on the other hand, on the Russian side, there is this sense of com uh, the continuity. Um, it's the same Dmitry Kozak that appears, and there are similar plans, on, be it on federalizations or something called JCC or JCCC. Uh, we have um, had formats in South Ossetia, 3 plus 2, 5 plus 2, uh, which have um, uh, uh, similarities to the Transnistria, and, and also some of these ideas um, uh, reappeared when it came to uh, Donbass. Uh, and of course, uh, as I said, there's th there is this political pol uh, and diplomatic imperative, the need to act fast, to stop military violence, to establish the diplomatic uh, uh, process and start negotiations and so forth. And that is done under a, a quite significant time pressure which means that and inevitably we're also negotiating with the OSCE is a consensus-based organization. So each mandate, uh, 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 each uh, uh, process uh, needs the approval of everyone, including uh, also the uh, conflicting parties uh, and also the violating state uh, who has violated the very uh, the principles and commitments of the OSCE. Uh, which means that they are compromises and they are imperfect. But it, as we also heard here, once we have these mechanisms and formats in place, it's very, very difficult to renegotiate them, to reform them and have a fresh look. And you all talked about the, 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 the need to revisit them. Uh, 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 you were to different degrees more or less pessimistic um, or optimistic uh, on, on, on the utility of these mechanisms, where I think Vladimir Sokro was very clear of, of that they have played out the role. And Professor Wolf uh, sees uh, uh, the sort of uh, still, uh, and, and, and Veronica, the, the uh, underutilized potential of, 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 of these formats. 
But the question then is, what, how can we have this fresh look? How is it possible uh, to uh, uh, revitalize and maybe reform and change some of the mechanisms uh, uh, um, uh, and, and formats? Um, is there a, a danger of uh, resignation and lack of urgency um, from the international community? Uh, one, one often used the concept of frozen conflicts, uh, which uh, we don't use here. We have used the word protracted conflicts, and we know that they are not frozen and they can be unfrozen at any time. But that sounds, uh, maybe that's um, a, a convenient way of the international community, so to say, to park these problems, which seems unsolvable. And um, as long as it's, it's uh, uh, reasonably peaceful, uh, there's no sense of urgency. So how can we, how can we from the international community side, uh, reinstate this sense of urgency and a new energy and new political investments in these processes, uh, be it either to reform the existing processes or to 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 uh, have a look at new possibilities and how they can be broadened or perhaps new new format and mechanisms. So I would be very interesting to hear a little bit, you know, more forward looking and also the lessons learned. Well, has there really, Veronica, you mentioned this process leading up to, to the Astana uh, 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 summit, but how much lessons learned has there been in, in the broader analytical and academic community? And how much lessons learned uh, 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 and, and a sort of more sober uh, uh, analytical, uh, self-critical look has there been in the international political and, and diplomatic community uh, and, and, and in this field? Uh, I throw out these um, uh, questions, and I don't know who wants to have a go first on 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 this topic. The, the feasibility and the desirability uh, of, of uh, having a fresh look and, and changing the uh, and improving um, and 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 how to look forward. John, did I see a hand there? John, please. Yes, thank you. Um, Maybe I'll start with picking up some, something that Ambassador Bard mentioned, uh, EU unity. Uh, it's crucial that the EU sticks together here. And I think many were perhaps surprised um, how, uh, how, uh, how well the EU did keep together after uh, Russia's military aggression against Ukraine started. But that needs to be preserved. Um, and the EU also needs to work with um, key allies and partners uh, in Washington, um, but also um, NATO, others, uh, Canada, the UK, Norway, what have you. Um, also, countries that are perhaps a little bit less like-minded but still matter, like Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a main actor in all of these countries where protracted conflicts play out. Uh, we've also seen that Turkey may do things without coordinating uh, with Brussels uh, or Washington. Um, Russia, Turkey has a complicated sort of cooperative, competitive relationship with Moscow. There are many reasons to to, to look at what Turkey does and, and, and see how that may affect uh, the, the, the calculus among uh, different parties. Um, I also think that more could be done. The UN was mentioned as well, uh, sort of United Nations uh, General Assembly resolutions. More could be done there uh, to reach out uh, to third countries elsewhere. Uh, we've seen that uh, the support for uh, countries like Ukraine uh, and Georgia uh, has to some extent diminished over the years. I think more could be done there. Um, I think a key word that is sometimes missing in the discussion in, in general is accountability. Um, and at a minimum, um, this means using clear language about what's going on, uh, voicing criticism. If you don't do that, it it may be interpreted as a kind of silent acceptance of what's going on. Um, and that sort of legitimizes uh, the, the violations that are ongoing. Uh, it risks making them permanent, uh, maybe even risks eroding customary international law and increases the risk for further transgressions elsewhere, also beyond the region and Europe. Um, it's a sort of attack on the rules-based international order in general. And here, I think 
I agree with Mr. Sokor that special status is, is tricky. Um, and we know that this is something that uh, is mentioned in, in the Minsk agreements. We know that um, President Poroshenko um, in Kiev at the time, 2014 and 15, he agreed to the Minsk agreements. Um, we must not forget that he did this basically with a gun towards his head. This was after Russia had inserted regular army units, uh, first in Ilovaisk in 2014, and then in Debaltseva in 2015. Um, still, I think we need to do something to, to sort of change the discussion away from special status that is mentioned in, in the Minsk agreements to other things that are mentioned in the Minsk agreements. There is um, point 10 uh, of uh, the first Minsk agreement uh, and point 10 of the second one, which talks about uh, uh, the removal of unlawful uh, uh, military formations and military hardware. Uh, it talks about disarmament of all illegal groups. There's not much talk, uh, at least not in the public discussion, about these points of the Minsk agreements. And I think more emphasis needs to be put there. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, I saw uh, Stefan raised his hand and then Veronica and then Vladimir. So, Stefan, please. Yeah, I mean, um, I really, really want to agree with, uh, uh, with John on um, what, what he has uh, uh, said here. Um, so, I really think that one of the main shortcomings uh, um, that we have right now is really this um, insufficient attention to, uh, to accountability. Um, I mean, it's very rare that you even hear Crimea uh, mentioned in uh, a, a lot of these uh, discussions. And um, it really bugs me um, that, um, I mean, the international community is, is focused on a lot of things and has a lot of things on its plate. But this has probably been the gravest violation of uh, principles of international law, um, uh, certainly in this part of uh, uh, Europe uh, uh, since the end of the uh, Second World War. I mean, you could quibble whether there maybe was one or two others that were uh, worse than that. But I mean, that has been an annexation of territory like we have not seen uh, in quite some time. Let's, uh, uh, let's put it like that. And that that has really dropped off the agenda, I think is problematic. And I think it has follow on consequences for what's going on in all the other protracted uh, uh, conflicts. Um, I slightly disagree on the notion of special status being alien to uh, uh, the European uh, order. I mean, you have, at least a dozen uh, uh, similar arrangements, uh, whether they are called uh, autonomy arrangements or um, uh, devolution or uh, sort of asymmetric uh, uh, federalism. The problem with special status is that it's a fairly empty shell of a term that each side can, if it so chooses, fill with its own uh, particular content. And one of the Key shortcomings, and this is where I find myself in agreement with uh, 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 Vladimir Sokor again, is that neither Ukraine nor Moldova are really prepared uh, uh, right now to engage on substantive negotiations on what a special status that would actually be compatible with existing principles of international law would uh, uh, would look like. Um, so there is, in in a sense, there is. Uh, no preparedness, uh, I think, on uh, on the part of um, certainly Moldova. Um, I would also argue uh, uh, to to a degree uh, Ukraine to actually come up with something that would say, well, it had, doesn't have to be the Russian version of special status. There can be meaningful special status that does not look like a rehash of uh, uh, the two thousand and three Cossack uh, uh, memorandum. And the third point I, uh, I want to raise is um, one where sort of I'm more looking at this from the EU, uh, sorry, from the OSCE perspective than, than, than from the EU perspective. And I think from the OSCE's perspective, the role that the EU plays is not always unproblematic. Um, I mean, the EU has um, its own special status uh, uh, within the OSCE. Um, it has the right uh, uh, to speak there. Um, 
immediately after um, whichever country uh, holds the uh, uh, presidency uh, of the EU. It has significant uh, uh, both political and uh, uh, financial clout uh, uh, in the OSC. And all of that, I, I have absolutely no problem with it. But what it means for the OSCE that is that very often um, what might be quite valuable initiatives immediately become tainted if they are uh, uh, supported or initiated uh, uh, by the EU, because that then throws us back into this uh, uh, deep and um, deepening uh, um, rivalry that we are now seeing between sort of the various configurations of East and West also in the uh, OSCE. So I think in, in that sense, um, I mean, in many ways, a lot of the more bilaterally based uh, uh, relationships and initiatives that uh, EU member states and other member states uh, sort of of the non-geographical West uh, uh, have launched sometimes may actually be, uh, be more effective and less uh, tainted or less doomed uh, uh, to failure from the beginning simply because they are associated with the uh, EU. And I do also say that not as somebody who is particularly happy about Brexit, uh, so don't get me wrong here, I'm not anti-EU, uh, but I can see from within an OSCE perspective um, that um, the role of the EU is not necessarily always helpful, even though it is well-intentioned. Thank you. And now Veronica and then Vladimir. Uh, I want to answer your question how uh, the EU uh, mechanisms um, could be revamped, relaunched. And there actually, there's one word, reality knocks. Today I heard the Swedish Minister for Defence, uh, Mr. Peter Holkvist, saying that uh, what's happening between Belarus and Poland today, it's a huge a security risk, and he sees Russia behind this. I quote uh, his quote, and we also have the recent, uh, and, and we here we're talking about two OSCE member states. It's it's a reality that that is is a, a real conflict, a real crisis going on. And we recently also had the relapse, as you have mentioned, of conflict between um, Armenia and Azerbaijan. So. These are all reminders of that the OC is not only uh, a mechanism of an organization with mechanism and, and, and principles. There is a re reality where these are not observed. And that, that should sort of shake us to, to uh, awareness that we need to act. And I, I fully agree with Professor Wolf that, that uh, though we would like to see EU unity. Uh, and and uh, awareness and and um, and and a way of not addressing conflicts uh, with euphemisms uh, and and but call, calling uh, calling the uh, the spade a spade. But I, I, it, it's obvious that it is a problem if the EU is seen as a as a block that uh, uh, is not willing to see. Uh, uh, resolutions, but I, I, that's also why we we need to have a new um, take within the EU how to address uh, these these conflicts and accountability. Obviously, is one of these uh, very difficult issues, and and it's not only in the OCE. I from the years in in the UN in the and in the international organizations in Geneva, uh, I I bring with me. Uh, that it was almost not possible to discuss accountability, uh, uh, no matter what subject, be it uh, sex or sexual and uh, reproductive violence or whatever. So, uh, but, but but that does not prevent us from looking into how we can uh, address this. Because just to mention this example, both authors have brought up that. Um, Russia is swapping between internationalizing and localizing the conflict. That is a very good means of blurring the picture and escaping accountability, obviously. And that has to be addressed. Thank you. And Vladimir, please. Uh, given the deadlock in the existing negotiating processes, it is important for ourselves to try and change the vocabulary of the debate. 
the state of the vocabulary for many years has served Russia's interests. We should not speak about Minsk agreements. We should put the word agreements between pejorative inverted commas. The main goal of Western diplomacy in most of the conflicts has been what I have called conflict conservation rather than freeze, conflict conservation, allowing these issues to be sidelined in order not to perturb uh, Berlin's or Brussels's or Washington's bilateral relationships with Russia on other matters. So we should not allow this sidelining and conservation to take place quietly, but to try and change the vocabulary. The withdrawal of Russian troops should be unconditional, not conditional on the Kiev or uh, Tishino uh, accepting a special status for those territories. Remember, the special status is not to be granted unilaterally by Kiev or by Kishino to those territories. No, it's not a grant. It is going to be negotiated on a co-equal basis between Kishino and Tiraspol and between Kiev and Donetsk Luhansk under Russian mediation and with Russian troops in place. Therefore, we should say unconditional withdrawal of Russian troops. And this, by the way, is in full accordance with the 1999 OSCE Istanbul agreements, which speak about Russia's full and unconditional withdrawal of troops from Moldova. Later, other actors, including, by the way, Germany, have added the conditionality of Russian so-called peacekeeping troops should, be rem should remain because they are constructive, and a special status should be agreed upon. So we should say, as part of changing the vocabulary, unconditional withdrawal of Russian troops and unconditional respect for Russia, for, for Ukraine's or Moldova's uh, territorial integrity. About the European Union, it is a very valuable thing that the European Union has preserved its uh, co internal cohesiveness in uh, perpetuating the economic sanctions, although the sanctions don't bite very hard. And Russia has basically weathered the sanctions. But still, the sanctions are important. If not economically, at least psychologically and politically, the sanctions are uh, very important. Except, uh, apart from the issue of sanctions, the EU has been absent from the negotiations because it was bypassed by other actors. In the case of uh, Miss Group on Karabakh, for example, France, a member of the Triple Pot Chairmanship, has refused to yield its seat to the European Union. It represents itself in a national uh, capacity as France. The EU is a mere observer in Moldova, although the EU is the main Western actor in terms of reforming, reforming Moldova internally. NATO plays no role. The United States has allowed itself to be totally bypassed with the matter of the Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict, and is a mere observer in the Moldova negotiations, ironically, on a lower rank than Ukraine. The existing composition of the 5 plus 2 group in, uh, on, on Moldova Transnistria is, uh, is absurd. It was imposed by uh, Russia's former foreign minister Yevgeny Primakov back in 1997. Primakov decided that Russia should be a mediator alongside Ukraine, also as a mediator, with the OEC. Later on, the EU and uh, the US were added as observers without the right to initiate proposals. Now, Ukraine and Russia are at war with each other, but they are still ostensibly mediators between Kishino and Tiraspol on, on a co-equal basis, Kiev and Moscow. So this is a totally dysfunctional arrangement. It is not viable. It is a farcical arrangement and it should not continue. Again, I'm not saying it should be officially denounced. That would be counterproductive. It's not necessary to officially denounce it. It should simply be allowed to weather on the way. And finally, a note about the United States. The United States was, has been under-involved in the efforts 
to settle these conflicts. It has not played a role commensurate to its power and influence. This is largely because of the US policy during the Obama administration and its failed reset. We now seem to be headed for uh, another attempt at a reset with the Biden administration. Whereas the United States does play a constructive role, in fact, a vital role, and should be encouraged to continue and to amplify it, is in providing military assistance to Ukraine. It has been mentioned that Russia strenuously objects to NATO infrastructure being established in Ukraine. There is no NATO infrastructure in Ukraine, none. NATO plays a very modest role in providing military assistance to Ukraine. Military assistance is provided bilaterally by the United States to Ukraine outside the framework of NATO. There is a small informal coalition of the United States, Britain, and Canada outside of the framework of NATO, which provides military assistance to Ukraine on a bilateral basis. The Pentagon plays an active role, and this is where the United States involvement should be encouraged to grow further because it is vital to Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. And we will soon uh, start with the questions from the audience. And I've already uh, received a number of questions through those who watch this on Facebook. And just a housekeeping reminder to those of you who follow this on Zoom, that please don't raise your hand. I have Emil and Shatak Veneran and others have done that. But use the Q&A function to write your question uh, uh, through the Zoom and I will forward them. So I will then just follow up on, um, I think, what Veronica and, and, and Vladimir uh, said about euphemism and use of language and also tie in this to a question which we have received from the audience here. Um, uh, Veronica, I think you used the words of, of euphemisms and, and Vladimir, you said that we, we need to to um, uh, uh, change the way we use uh, uh, language. Um, uh, in diplomacy, um, uh, there is this uh, famous uh, technique uh, method of something called constructive ambiguity, uh, which can be a very helpful diplomatical tool and often is necessary, uh, especially in, in conflicting situations that like this. But I wonder if isn't there also a destructive ambiguity um, uh, when we don't sort of call a spade a spade? And that leads me to the question then, are we, uh, in the way we are treating these Eastern European countries uh, uh, and the way we talk to them, and there has been outside of, of this context, we haven't talked about this, but sort of related to the OEC, but not inside the OEC context, there has been a number of proposals of the of, on the table from uh, Western think tanks, uh, 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 Russian, European, Russian, Western initiatives and so forth uh, to create some kind of a solution uh, to these conflicts. And they are um, basically all based on some kind of idea of enforced neutrality, uh, security guarantees, um, uh, uh, and, and that uh, uh, which basically amounts to that these countries would be less sovereign, they would be less sovereign than other countries. Uh, uh, and are we there in a danger? Are we treating in, in the way from, from, from the Western political community, are we in the risk of treating these Eastern European countries as sort of second class uh, uh, countries? Uh, 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 and, and maybe we should ask ourselves the sort of the critical question or the litmus test. If something like this would happen to our own countries, uh, would we accept uh, concepts of, of, of special, special status? Uh, uh, would we um, sort of give up the right to self-defense according to the um, UN uh, Charter, Article 51, uh, and, and, and so forth? And here I want to tie in this with a question from the audience here, which uh, from Facebook, which goes like this. Is Europe in the risk of a new Cold War and a new wall, even if it's mental boundary rather than physical, so to say? Uh, so maybe some quick comments uh, on this, and then we will come back. And I ask you, because we have now uh, 25 minutes left, to keep your reflections and comments very quick. And, and there are a number of other questions that we want to return to. But uh, how, how um, are we sort of running the risk of being uh, in our ambiguity um, and in our diplomacy? 
diplomatic efforts actually to be destructive? Uh, uh, are we mentally treating uh, uh, the Eastern European states that less than sovereign states? And what would, if so, what would that mean of the concept of, of sovereignty? And, and where do we put the limits around that? And also, are we now uh, facing, or maybe we are all already in, a, a sort of new Cold War, a new division, be it mental or physical, uh, uh, between the East and West? And, and so, if so, where does this border go between the East and West? Uh, um, sort of one minute each, perhaps, here. I don't know who wants to start. Vladimir, please. Yeah, one minute. About uh, neutrality or non-alignment. It is a, a mistake to believe that uh, Russia's interpretation of neutrality or non-alignment of these countries would be not joining NATO. Russia's interpretation is far more far deeper and more comprehensive. These countries would not be allowed to have even bilateral defense relationships with Western powers, such as, for example, the United States, the foremost and most obvious candidate. Russia's interpretation of, of neutrality means no defense and security connection with any Western powers, NATO or non-NATO. Thank you. Uh, John? Thanks. Uh, just to add directly on that, on neutrality, I think one can note that um, Moldova's constitution says that Moldova should be neutral. There's a ban uh, on the deployment of foreign troops on the territory of Moldova. So far, this has not uh, contributed uh, or reached, this has not led to uh, conflict resolution. Um, of the supposedly internal conflict. The Russian troops are still there, um, violating uh, Moldova's territorial integrity. Um, so obviously such a constitutional um, addition is not sufficient um, to reach pro uh, progress. Um, and then on this sort of idea of forcing neutrality or in-between status on certain countries, that has been mentioned in, in the debate in the last few years. Um, but I think that would be very unlikely to bring stability for the reasons that I mentioned. This is also about Russian internal politics. Um, it's about the threat of uh, democracy, rule of law, uh, human rights to the Russian leadership. Um, our open democratic societies uh, are a threat to the Kremlin, not only because of what we do, but also because of what we are. So the risk is that uh, the baseline would just sort of be moved forward and there would be no uh, stability if such a grand bargain were to be made. Uh, thank you. Any, uh, Stefan, please. Just on the question of um, whether uh, we in the West are treating uh, countries in the East um, like second class uh, uh, countries or less sovereign countries, I don't think that that is necessarily intended, but I think the effect of many of the policies uh, that uh, we pursue is uh, uh, exactly uh, that. Uh, I mean, in the same way in which Russia is competing for influence uh, in these countries, uh, so is uh, uh, the EU, uh, uh, so, so is the US, um, I mean, whichever way you want to look at these uh, uh, configurations. Um, and, and I think, I mean, the whole idea of EU conditionality uh, uh, in many ways um, imposes uh, uh, certain reforms, again, that are really well-intentioned and um, um, well-meant, um, but they do force countries to make uh, uh, particular uh, choices that they may or may not uh, uh, otherwise take uh, uh, voluntarily. So I think from, from that perspective, it's also what, what I think is, is to some extent necessary is a greater degree of self-reflection of how our policies are being perceived both in those countries, um, but also, and, and not to sort of um, uh, become a, uh, I think it's called a Russia hugger uh, uh, in English. Um, I mean, one also has to be aware of how some of those policies are being perceived uh, in uh, uh, the Kremlin at least if one doesn't want to give um, uh, uh, further uh, succor to um, interpretations in Moscow that really, um, I mean, you know, facing 
you know, containment policies, uh, 2.0 encroachment of Russia and so on and so forth. Thank you. Veronica, did you want to add something or should we go to the next yes. set? Yes, please, if please. I may, uh, on uh, uh, the questions concerning double standards and second class treatment of Eastern European countries. In a sense, the very fact that we have seen war in Europe with uh, casualties and when it comes to Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, amounting to tens of thousands of, of victims and the humanitarian and health plight, I would say yes, because in other uh, areas of the world, there, there would be a quicker reaction. And it, it, has, it is hard, in, for example, in the UN system to raise what is going on in Ukraine and, and Georgia and, and Moldova. And uh, concerning uh, whether we are uh, on our way uh, to... Uh, an era of a new Cold War, I would say no, but there is a war on systems because we have such differing and non-compatible objectives, uh, societies in the West and, and Russia and, and some of the countries uh, supporting Russian policy when it comes to power sharing, rule of your, your law, human rights uh, and, and civil society um, this possibility to act uh, an independent law, etc., and 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 this is spreading. This is why I pointed uh, at the importance of keeping an overview of, of what's going on on the whole international arena. And last but not least, I I, I sense it still <laughs> in in both mind and body the attempt in Astana uh, to forge a settlement uh, on conflicts in Transnistria and Georgia. With, uh, the, on, with the price of, uh, of lesser sovereignty of these countries. This was blocked, however, and I won't say which countries blocked and which did, did not, but it was blocked. And I hope that we can revisit that and remind ourselves of that. Uh, thank you. We have now a whole set of questions from the audience. Uh, we have several questions regarding uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, we have one question uh, based from Georgia, so to say, but a more general one. Uh, um, uh, so uh, maybe we start with, with, with the Karabakh ones. Um, uh, and I try to shorten this a little bit. Um, uh, during uh, the recent uh, Karabakh uh, war, uh, we have seen a minimum involvement from uh, political involvement by France and the United States, uh, who has been part of uh, mediators of, of co-chairs of the Minsk group. Uh, but on the other hand, the Turkey took an active stance both during the war and, and, and afterwards. And today we have both Russian and Turkish military monitoring groups in the city of Agdam. Uh, and it seems like the Russia doesn't have a problem with the Turkish presence. So I wonder whether this was a deliberate geopolitical move by Russia in its chess game, where, chess game where the role of Turkey in the conflict was tolerated in order to reduce the influence of France and the United States which can be assumed to be in Russia's interest to keep away Western powers. And the other one um, uh, is that we now, according to the November agreement, there is a Russian peacekeeping force in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is to be deployed for five years. Is it probably uh, 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 in the Russia's interest to prolong its stay in the region for an additional five years, uh, which can be done if neither the conflict parties are against it? And how do you, in the panel, prognose uh, 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 the Russian military presence in Karabakh in the region after 2025? And can we expect an escalation of the conflict in the future uh, uh, also to serve Russia's in interest in, 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 in this conflict? Uh, then uh, we have uh, yet another one on, on Karabakh. Uh, uh, and uh, is the question of, of, of the Karabakh War 2020 uh, and uh, do we have now, uh, this is a new case study for protracted conflicts in Eastern Europe. Uh, and has this led to a rethinking of conflict resolution in the region? And uh, has it really gotten the attention in the research uh, field as it deserves? And uh, what's your take on Russia, uh, that Russia identifies itself as a peacekeeper in, 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 in the post-Karabakh uh, war? Um, then uh, just to... Uh, uh, add on a question then from a Georgian uh, perspective from Shota Gvineria, who says that Ran Russia managed to regionalize and fully monopolize conflicts in the Eastern Partnership countries at the expense of amb ambivalent uh, uh, engagement of the West. 
and uh, absence of EU policy, strategy, and even vision is obvious, and Moscow makes its policies based on that. Um, and uh, further, that uh, also Western often call on both sides uh, uh, and try to stay neutral, and all the West uh, cares about is avoid provoking Russia. Um, uh, uh, however, what provokes Russia is the lack of a deferent uh, uh, and opportunity to pursue its uh, aggressive policies with, without consequences. And uh, he, Shota, uh, uh, says that uh, the current uh, Georgian government policy is a good example of that, uh, and that Russia has uh, gotten in return, uh, uh, that is, that it has become uh, disappeared from the discussions and silently losing more and more territory. So the question is. How can the West reinstate itself as a credible player? Um, and why can't the EU and NATO recognize Georgia's territories as occupied, which also leads to the sort of bigger uh, 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 philosophical and, and legal question of international law of, of terminology and occupation and, and the implications of that. Um, so uh, a complex of questions on Nagorno-Karabakh, the future, Russia's role, Turkey, uh, and if, what, if we can make some predictions from the future on that. And also, uh, based on the example of Georgia, uh, uh, what can the, the West uh, uh, do more to, to become a credible player uh, and uh, uh, how to deal with, with recognition of, of occupation? Who wants to? And again, very, very brief, because we have a second set of questions after this. So, so uh, Vladimir, please. The first, the first question about Karabakh was very astutely posed, and it basically answers itself. Uh, I would like to add, however, the following. Azerbaijan has rejected the notion of special status for Karabakh. And Russia does not seem to object to that. Ukraine and Moldova should take an example. No special status. Azerbaijan has set a very useful precedent. Second, Russian peacekeepers in quotation marks in, uh, in, uh, in Karabakh. Here also, Russia has tricked the OSCE. The OSCE had an internal agreement since 1994 to provide a peacekeeping force for Karabakh on certain principles, including uh, no peacekeeping troops from co-chairing countries of the Minsk uh, group and no peacekeeping troops from neighboring countries. Russia is, of course, both a co-chairing country and the, and the neighboring country, and it has simply tricked the OSCE to no protest from the OSCE because the OSCE can only operate on internal consensus with Russia's agreement. The OSCE can not, not move, not even speak, without prior negotiation with Russia inside the organization. About semantics, we should not say Nagorno. Nagorno is not in the language of either of the nationalities inhabiting that region. It is a Russian and Soviet legacy. It's neither in Armenian nor in Azerbaijan. The Germans say Berg Karabakh. The French say O Karabakh, O meaning high. Only the United States, by some inertia, says Nagorno. The decision, by the way, is made by the United States State Department's Office of the Geographer. That office makes the decision. Perhaps that uh, office is theologically challenged, let's say. So no more Nagorno. Uh, and finally, uh, regarding... Uh, yeah, regarding Shota Gvineria's uh, questions, I, I endorse uh, everything that uh, Shota says. And unfortunately, the um, uh, current government of Georgia is not dedicated either to European integration or to a resolution of the conserved conflicts in, in uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It is interested simply in the retention of its own political power. Thank you. Uh, other comments, uh, answers from the panel of, of these questions? John, quick. Yeah, a quick one on Georgia. Uh, I think 
the EU uh, could probably do more, but it's actually doing some things. Uh, the Eastern Partnership was launched in 2009 and contributes to the democratic and economic development of Georgia. And that matters indirectly also for Tbilisi's uh, handling of the conflict situation. Over time, Georgia will hopefully become more prosperous, uh, becoming more attractive to the people living in the, the areas not controlled by the government, and also then will gain uh, more uh, capability to deal with um, the, the, the conflict situation. Um, the EU monitoring mission should also not be forgotten. It does play a role um, for monitoring purposes. Uh, I think maybe more could be done to stress Russia's non-fulfillment of the six-point agreement. There's a clear point about uh, Russian military forces that should withdraw to the lines held prior to the outbreak of hostilities. Uh, according to Moscow, there were no Russian military uh, forces uh, in Georgia before the outbreak of hostilities. So uh, they should then uh, leave uh, Georgia's territory and fulfill uh, the agreement. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Stefan and Veronica, do you want to add anything on this? Okay. Then we, I think we go now for the final uh, set of questions. And we have here one from Ian Bond from the Center of European Reform in London. And he writes like this. As a former diplomat, I understand the belief that every problem has a solution and the desire to find that solution. But would it be better at a certain point if Ukraine and Georgia said that they washed their hands of their various occupied territories with NATO responding by offering them immediate membership and an Article 5 guarantee for the territories they can control de facto. Very loosely similar to Cold War position on Germany pre-1969. The FRG regarded itself, the Federal Republic of Germany regarded itself as representing the whole of Germany, but did not ask NATO to extend Article 5 to cover the GDR, the German Democratic Republic territory. Uh, and then uh, another question, and we touched a little bit this, is it possible now to have, uh, a, 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 there's a major conflict, and I think this was mentioned as the, the, the most serious uh, uh, violation in the first illegal annexation uh, of territory in Europe since the Second World War, namely Crimea. There is no conflict-solving mechanisms or format for that. Uh, there was this um, uh, uh, attempt this summer uh, from Ukraine to establish a Crimea platform and so forth. What are the prospects to have some kind of international uh, a conversation on Crimea. And finally, and this I think is meant more perhaps a, like a rhetorical question, uh, will a similar group of people sit in a seminar um, uh, and discuss this topic in 30 years from now without any changes? Uh, uh, let's hope not. But then for a final round of comments here uh, before we wrap up this uh, and also reflections on the seminar um, uh, as a whole, uh, so maybe I suggest that maybe we go in reverse order uh, from the speakers. So if we start with uh, uh, Veronica, then Vladimir, then, then John, and then Stefan, uh, one maximum a minute and a half each. Thank you. Oh, I think Ian Bond's question is, is very difficult to address, especially since we, there are so many challenges. Uh, it's not only the protracted conflicts, as, as, for example, uh, John Sacco has pointed out, uh, because these, co these conflicts are not restricted to, um, to the, the, uh, the, the area of the conflict or the neighboring countries, but it aims at, at the West uh, as well. So, and, and it aims at the, the principles and the societies um, uh, we are representing. Um, it, it was a different time back in 1969. And, and as for Ukraine and uh, uh, Crimea conflict resolution mechanism, uh, I, the prospects are, are bleak, I would say, uh, because there is a little unity right now. But what is extremely is import, important is that the international community, EU member states, OC member states, keep raising the occupation um, as a matter of uh, international law to keep up uh, um, the uh, um, awareness that, that this is unlawful uh, uh, and also to, to raise all the connecting issues or humanitarian issues uh, and so, so on um, until maybe the time is, is ripe. I mean, the, again, there is this 
um, fear of, of forgetting what is going on in Eastern Europe. Uh, thank you, Veronica. Uh, Vladimir, a minute, two minutes and a half, please. Yes, one minute. Final recommendations. Drop special status. Demand unconditional withdrawal of uh, Russian troops. Change the semantics. Use uh, terms like peacekeeping or missed agreements in pejorative uh, quotation marks. Keep and intensify if necessary, the economic sanctions on uh, Russia, and keep raising these issues outside the established negotiation mechanisms, write them off, just write them off, and keep raising these issues in more effective and more legitimate international organizations, such as the United Nations, the European Union, and every possible international organization, following a harassment tactic. Harass Russia in all these organizations, but outside the, the existing negotiating format, which has lost legitimacy and exhausted themselves, and don't try to reconvene them on Russian conditions. Thank you. Thank you. And John, uh, also a minute, two minutes and a half. Yes, please. thank you. Uh, I agreed uh, what Ambassador Bard Veronica said about these conflicts not only being territorial, uh, meaning I think it would be very hard for countries like Georgia and Ukraine to wash their hands. Uh, I don't think that would uh, and sort of let go of these uh, non-government controlled areas that would not solve the problem. Uh, not to forget uh, there is a ceasefire in eastern Ukraine, but it's a very fragile one. Uh, People die and get wounded more or less on a daily basis. Um, that's also a, a different situation compared to uh, how it was in Germany. Uh, and you may draw lessons from history, but it, it rhymes rather than repeats itself. Uh, and it, it's tricky to do. But I'll end on a hopeful note, and that is that the Berlin Wall stood for less than 30 years. And hopefully, uh, if we keep raising the issue of Crimea uh, wherever possible, the, the issue of non-recognition, the human rights problems, uh, the militarization uh, that Russia carries out there and so on and so forth, uh, maybe we will not sit here in 30 years and discuss uh, these issues. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Stefan, please. One, minute One brief to comment on, on Ian Bond's uh, uh, question. Um, I think that would potentially be quite useful as a negotiation tactic to just call Russia's bluff or call the separatists bluff and say, okay, be independent uh, uh, and then see what actually uh, happens. And I think that might actually trigger uh, uh, potentially more meaningful engagement on what the future, whatever we want to call it, uh, a special status or otherwise uh, might look like that would preserve the viability of the states that are now um, uh, territorially uh, challenged. Uh, on a broader note of reflection, I think it's also important to, to realize that these uh, conflicts, uh, they are all very important uh, uh, to us here on the panel and uh, presumably to the people in the audience. But we also have to be realistic about how high a priority they actually have uh, for the key players involved in these uh, conflicts. And whilst I'm not suggesting that we simply continue with a policy of what uh, Vlad Soko called conflict conservation, I mean, keeping a status quo that is reasonably stable may be a much preferable option than throwing the baby out with the bathwater and making things worse. Uh, by pursuing what right now, I don't think anybody has the stomach or the resources uh, would be a much harsher line uh, on Russia. Nor do I think that this is necessarily really the top issue uh, where um, uh, countries uh, uh, in the West are concerned when it comes to what's really important on the international security uh, agenda. So we always, I think, have to see this within this broader geopolitical uh, context where, yes, Russia may be a pain in Eastern Europe, um, but still there are areas where it is absolutely vital uh, to be able to, to talk to and cooperate, uh, uh, even with Russia, no matter how reprehensible some might find uh, uh, the current government there. 
Thank you uh, to the panel, uh, Professor Stefan Wolf, uh, John Sachau, uh, uh, Vladimir Sokov, and Ambassador Veronica Bord for today's very rich and substantial uh, discussion. And again, I uh, uh, recommend uh, deeply, warmly, everyone who has not read the two reports that was presented today by Professor Wolf and, and John Sachau. Uh, uh, to do that, um, because they are also very rich and substantial in analysis. I think we've had uh, a quite a, 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 a broad consensus of, of the nature of these conflicts, the challenges that these conflicts uh, 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 mean in terms of humanitarian suffering, uh, of human rights violations, of uh, normative issues, violations of international law, and of OSCE principles and commitments and the wider security policy commitments uh, of these violations, which go far beyond uh, uh, these regions. They are then not only sort of local or regional conflicts, but they have implications for the European security system and European security order. Uh, we've heard uh, slightly divergent and, and, and from different angles and aspects views of the the, the um, usability uh, 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 and desirability and the potential of the existing formats uh, uh, and, and mechanisms. And uh, 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 but I think we all in this discussion today, and perhaps maybe this is the most most important takeaway underlines the uh, importance of a continued international interest and engagement uh, e e exactly because of the reasons uh, which have been mentioned uh, for this region and these conflicts. Again, uh, this was report number five, five and six in our report series of human rights and security in Eastern Europe. Uh, the previous four, the first three has been about Ukraine and Donbass the fourth one on Transnistria, and in the coming weeks we will have forthcoming presentations and publications of reports on uh, conflicts in Georgia, Russian-Georgian conflicts, on Nagorno-Karabakh, and also on the international law, and especially the applicability of international humanitarian law to the protracted conflicts and how to deal with accountability in that. Um, so, uh, and we were also planning to do, because all these reports contain policy recommendations, and we're also planning to public, uh, publish a 10th report, which is a sort of a summary uh, uh, of the policy recommendations that we hope to be able to present and publish and discuss in the beginning of December or end of November, preferably um, ahead of the OSCE ministerial, which will take place outside of Stockholm at the beginning of December. So uh, please follow us, uh, watch our homepage, follow us on Twitter, uh, because there will be much more exciting things coming up uh, in the coming weeks and on especially this topic. Again, today's, uh, uh, today's uh, discussion uh, has been uh, uh, recorded and will also be then uh, on, on, on the UI homepage, which can be uh, viewed uh, later on. And again, uh, a really warm thank uh, to our, our two uh, report authors and introducers here today, to the two discussants, and to a, a very lively and interested uh, and engaged audience. And I hope to see you soon. So thank you uh, from today from Stockholm.